Now, part of this may be because of the old understanding of who qualifies for unemployment. And what we do know is that the CARES Act, which was signed by the president, actually expands the definition of those that can apply and receive unemployment. Then we also asked, have you or will you apply for the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan? Again, similar figures, 24% said yes, 68% said no. Uh, are you applying for the SBA Paycheck Protection Program? Again, the same general response, 20% said yes, 80% said no. And we know anecdotally people got back to us about how difficult it was to apply for this, uh, that they heard the money had run out already, that they heard there were difficulties. Uh, some people did not have business checking accounts or a relationship with the bank, and that made an impact on how far they could go for the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, if you're a family child care provider, and we ask very specific questions of family child care providers, did you apply for unemployment insurance as a result of the CARES Act? And again, what we saw was 20% indicated yes, 80% indicated no. Now, again, that can be a mix of not understanding that they might be eligible for unemployment, but it also could be that their programs were open, they didn't need to apply for unemployment. So, uh, not waiting any longer, we want to introduce our two panelists one at a time. Our first is a family child care provider from Montgomery County, Maria Peso. And Maria, I'm going to turn it over to you for your presentation. Please remember to unmute. Thank you, Steve. Good evening. My name is Maria Peso, and I am a registered family child care provider for the past 25 years. I am located in Montgomery Village. I'm licensed for eight children. In March, when schools closed due to the pandemic, I discussed with my childcare parents as to how we were going to approach this disaster. The parents and I decided that I would stay open until a stay at home order was issued. On the 27th of March, all childcare facilities were ordered to shut down and could reopen on the 30th with an EPCC permit. I received my permit on the 31st and I contacted my parents as most of them were essential workers. Only three families were ready to send their children back. I had two infants under the age of one and a three-year-old. A lot of hard work went into cleaning and preparing the facility for, for, my, for my kids. I had to put away a lot of materials and kept only a minimum out the infant room changed from four cribs to two cribs. All stuffed animals, books made of fabric, and, it, and materials that were hard to clean, disinfect, and sanitize were put away. Curbside pickup and drop off, temperature checks, sign in and sign out were done at the entrance. I created areas for each child so they could maintain social distancing. No backpacks or toys were allowed from home. Infants did not like me wearing a mask and they would cry. The cleaning, sanitizing and disinfectant, disinfecting is what I do all the time, except I do it more frequently now. Getting ready for the EPCC site was hard enough. Dealing with the financial aspect was entirely different. My income had that drastically changed to one third of what I used to make on a weekly basis. Frustrated as I had no way to know how to get finances to help me bridge the gap that I was facing. Thankfully, the Resource and Referral Center, Maryland State Department of Education, worked hard for providers to be able to get help and obtain free cleaning supplies. To relieve my stress and anxiety, I have a support group of providers. We uplift one another, discuss problems, and talk to each other on a daily basis. I go for walks, listen to music, I do gardening, and I listen to the news only once a day. My concern is that when we open up to phase two, 
whether I will be able to have a full capacity or will I have to start fresh? I guess we have to be hopeful and positive that things will work out for the better. I thank Maryland Family Network for giving me this opportunity to participate in the virtual conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I was uh, turning here because I was making some notes as Maria was talking. And I know in talking to providers, plus the comments we heard on the uh, survey, uh, she, she raised several things that I wanna raise. Uh, it, it was a, a very different experience for all of us during the pandemic, of course. Uh, it was made more difficult because we had to change some of the very basic things we do as caregivers. I was a classroom teacher, I was a center director. Uh, it's been a while, but I still remember that and I think fondly about it. Uh, but that disruption, not just in terms of the number of children who could come, uh, the types of parents who could use our care, but some of the other things that were very different is number one, social distancing. And before this pandemic, if someone had told you about instituting social distancing in your childcare program, you would have looked at them a little bit stunned because that's not what children do. And generally that's not what people in childcare do. Social distancing is the opposite of what we do during normal times. So it's very difficult for us to put that into place. Uh, the second is limiting toys and equipment. Uh, how many of you can relate to how we always are uh, prompting children to share their toys, uh, to uh, play with one another, uh, to get involved in deep play very close to one another and to share uh, their equipment and materials. Again, that's a very different thing that we're doing now as well. Uh, as Maria mentioned, wearing a mask. Uh, mm -hmm. Children, uh, we, we work with language with children, but we also know that language is that nonverbal piece, the expression they see on our face, uh, the faces we make to engage them. So this is a very different thing that we're doing as well. And it's very difficult to change how we relate to people when they can't see half of our faces. And then finally, uh, parents cannot come into our programs. We have to meet them at the door or at the curb. And in addition to the kind of greetings and uh, talk that we do with parents normally at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, now we have to do temperature checks. We have to ask about the health situation. Uh, we have to take a clipboard out for them to sign instead of them coming in or doing it right at the door. So uh, we recognize that this is a myriad of things that providers need to get uh, in their heads in terms of how do we do this? How do we do it better? How do we do it differently? And oh my goodness, what I hear from most providers is how much longer is this gonna be? Um, and uh, Maria mentioned, and I can relate to this, she listens to the news once a day. Uh, and again, I can relate to it. I know I had to cut back on my news consumption. Uh, and what we hear on the news isn't always uh, reinforcing of what we would like this to get to in terms of moving this along. Uh, we hear about spikes. We hear about uh, different things from different countries. Even in the United States, we hear different states are at different levels. So there are two other things that we wanna talk about uh, with uh, what we found. Uh, number one, we asked what will happen to your business if families keep children home for extended periods or if you're closed for an extended period of time. And 51% indicated they would have to close their program if this went on for any length of time. The second thing we're hearing is they would have to lay off employees and we're hearing this very clearly. It's, we're actually getting inconsistent information from the field in terms of how full some programs are, that many programs, as Maria talked about, still have vacancies. Uh, when you look at the unemployment figures for Maryland, when you look at some of the concerns that parents have, uh, it's difficult to figure out how much longer this is gonna go on either uh, as uh, the governor has, has indicated orders or as parents decide on their own, regardless of what the governor, governor says I can do, I'm gonna keep my children home longer than, than uh, I was originally thinking. Uh, reducing program hours uh, is another thing we heard from almost 20% of people. 
and then reducing employer employee hours, that's another thing that we're hearing. Uh, as well as increasing tuition. Uh, if I don't have the same amount of children, I need to bring in more income, I need to increase my tuition, and we understand that very clearly. Uh, the second thing we asked along the line of uh, economic benefits is what kind of support might your business or program need? 72%, almost three quarters indicated they would need grants to pay for fixed costs. So fixed costs would be things like mortgage, rent, utilities, uh, grants for reopening. Uh, and what we know from uh, the protocol that MSDE has in place, and the protocol makes perfect sense, programs need to do deep cleaning, not just to reopen, but depending on how many different children come through the program, deep cleaning needs to be done more regularly than just opening or reopening a site. Regulatory relief, are there changes that are, uh, might be in place in terms of regulations? And we see that currently with the temporary lifting of regulations by the Maryland State Department of Education regarding group size and adult child ratios. Help with applying for governor, government assistance. And we hear this uh, very much. Again, many people were surprised by all the hoops they had to jump through for unemployment or for uh, the Paycheck Protection Program or the Small Business Administration emergency loans. So this clearly is a, a direction we need to move in, in terms of helping people apply for these programs that are already there. And then grants to pay for staff during closure. And again, what we saw was MSDE was able to put into place for those programs that accepted children on the child care scholarship or the subsidy program, uh, MSDE continued to pay those programs that were closed for children who were enrolled or for those programs that were open, but their parents did not send them. Uh, so that was of benefit as well. So, uh, and then low interest loans to help pay for some of the expenses or for, for changes. And certainly one of the big things that we hear, and I know that MSDE hears this as well, is uh, in order to cope with this, do I need to put in temporary room dividers or plexiglass? Uh, so that is an area that uh, providers are very interested in. So we heard from Maria, and next we're going to hear from Tracy Harris, who is a child care center operator. She's with, she's the director of the Weinberg Early Childhood Center with the Downtown Baltimore Child Care Program. And Tracy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. March 13th, we followed the governor's recommendation and closed due to COVID-19. During this closure, as an organization, we had to decide our next steps. After careful consideration, we decided to provide care for essential personnel. This decision dictated our roles as unsung heroes. We had to decide how to safely operate. The protocols we put in place included screenings of all staff and children, temperature checks, increased cleaning throughout the day, no commingling at the classrooms, staff wearing masks, social distancing when possible, and curbside pickup and drop off. In a matter of two weeks, we went from having over 80 children to just over a little over 10 the first week. Currently, we have a little over 20 children. Our program was fortunate to have the support of Maryland Family Network through Early Head Start funding, Johns Hopkins University, the Maryland State Department of Education through subsidy and essential personnel child care payments. As a program, we wanted to ensure we were staying engaged, not only with staff and families on site, but those off site we were able to meet our obligation through weekly activities, videos, Zoom meetings, and parent teacher conferences. Also, we were able to have distribution days for our early Head Start families, where we gave away items such as books, food, wipes, diapers, and cleaning supplies. We were able to keep staff engaged through virtual staff meetings, team building activities, and professional development that included for some over 100 hours of trainings completed. 
One of our teacher's videos, they included teaching a concept, was featured on MSD's website several times. After a few weeks of being open for essential personnel, a staff member tested positive for COVID-19. We wanted to ensure everyone stayed safe and healthy. This required constant communication with the Baltimore City Health Department for guidance. There were no transmissions from that positive case, which reassured us that our safety measures were working. While planning for the upcoming program year, one of our biggest challenges included parents having reservations about sending their child back to care. One way that I addressed some of the reservations was through phone conversations, explaining protocols put in place. Throughout this entire time, I have been reminded even more of the essential role of early childhood professionals. While not always shower for praises, the role of early childhood professionals cannot be overlooked. Again, I want to thank our partners for continued support, especially during this challenging time. It is imperative that programs receive support to sustain high quality early childhood programs. As you all know, the first five years are the most important. Thank you, Tracy. So for those who are participating in this webinar, I again wanna point out the two things at the bottom of your page, the bottom of the screen that you can find helpful. Number one is on the bottom right-hand side where it says Q&A, that's where we will ask you to put your questions uh, or concerns. And I have three that I want to get to in just a moment. But then on the, the left hand side at the bottom is the chat box. And the chat box, if you've not been following it, has instructions as to where you can go, what the link is to download the PowerPoint for this particular webinar. So um, Tracy and Maria, I want to ask you each some of the questions that I've come up here that have come up in the uh, in the question and answer. And uh, Maria, I'm gonna uh, start with you first, if you don't mind. So a question, but I do wanna ask Tracy as well. Uh, someone asked, uh, I would like to know if you work full time and same hours as before. Maria, are you finding you're working the same hours? Um, almost the same. Um, I open at between eight and 8.30 and pick up is between 4.30 and five. Um, it's just because um, I used to open at 7.30 to 5.30, but now I open between 8 and 8.30 to 4.30 4 to 5. Okay. Um, and the drop-off and pick-up are staggered timing so that the parents are not there at the same time. And do you, do you uh, open only weekdays or are you open weekends? Um, I'm only open Monday to Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy, how about your operation? Are you all working the same hours and the same days? Yes, Steve, thank you for your question. Yes, we are all still working um, those on site full time. Okay. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize with Tracy's operation, and we know that Tracy's operation is different than many other child care programs is, as Tracy mentioned, they receive early Head Start funding. Um, and if you've been following the news, what the federal government decided to do both with Early Head Start and with Head Start is that uh, the programs could close, but they would continue paying for those programs and paying for those staff. So that's one of the benefits that her program had. The other, and if you recall her comments, they currently participate and previously participate in the child care subsidy slash scholarship program. And as many of you know, those children who were enrolled prior to COVID were still paid for during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we would like to see, and this is part of our recommendations, a broader way of supporting childcare programs with coordination of resources, much like Tracy's program has, uh, and ways to fit into other systems of care. So for instance, public pre-K, uh, coordinated health approaches, those sorts of things. Um, here's a question that's very specific to family child care. And Maria, I'll ask you if you have some thoughts on this. It says the demand for child care provider at home is more than center and large family. Uh, why is the government assigning most of the money uh, for, uh, for us? Uh, 
she talks about the big fish always get the big, big uh, best and biggest results. Uh, Maria, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of family child care and the setting for family child care? Um, I think that the family child care providers don't benefit as much as the centers um, because we, we, we don't have any of the Head Start program. Um, and we, we, um, most of us don't have subsidy uh, kids, kids with scholarships. Only, only, only a few providers have um, children with scholarships and they got paid. So the people who did not have any other scholarships or anything like that, we, were, we did not receive any kind of uh, payments with the exception of um, the EPCC when we opened up. Okay. Thank you. Um, here's a question for each of you, and I'll start with Tracy on this one. Um, it says, can you share best practices for social distancing the children? Tracy, do you want to take a crack at that and then we'll have Maria sure. answer it as well? Thank you for the question. So one of the ways um, to, we've been trying to promote social distancing at the center, we have um, shared spaces, like we have a huge growth motor room that we have closed to ensure it's no commingling whatsoever. And in the classroom, we have encouraged the teachers to spread out where they used to, you know, family style um, eating for lunchtime. We've encouraged the teachers to spread the children out, as well as some of the classrooms have engaged in such as two um, morning meeting times as opposed to one big group. Okay. Maria, how about you? Any Thank best you, practices for social distancing and family child care? Thank you, Steve. I, um, I have different centers in my program. So when the kids, I was lucky that I only had three kids, but beginning next week, I'll start having more kids. And then what, what, I'm, what I've decided to do is have a child in each area. Unless they are siblings, then they both can be in one area. And the outdoor toys, I've kind of moved my toys around. So all the riding toys are on the patio. All the climbing toys are away, um, are where the mulch area is. And all the houses are put closer to the fence where they, we can separate the kids to go and play. Um, based on what you said, Maria, I'm curious both from you and Tracy, do you find yourself, because of this, going outdoors more with children, depending on the weather? Tracy, do you want to start with that? Um, I do see the teachers um, going out more because we are centered um, just to ensure that social distancing piece and so that there's no cleanly in the classrooms. Only we are fortunate to have three play courts um, at our center, so only we only allow one classroom at a time, so there's no mixing. Okay, that's good advice, Maria. I know you have younger children, so this may not apply to you, but do you find yourself taking them out more? Yes, Steve. We okay. go out a lot more. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tracy, this is a very specific question for you. It says, did you have to close your center temporarily when your staff tested positive? I wonder if yes. you can give us a little more detail on that, if you're comfortable, please. Yes, I'm comfortable. Um, the recommendation and guidance from the Baltimore City Health Department, we had to close for two weeks. And one thing I can say just for guidance and especially for those listening is it's imperative that um, if you're not currently open, once you do open, it is extremely important to remain transparent with the Baltimore City Health Department just about if staff start to exhibit any type of symptoms. And as I stated, when I presented, it kind of reassured us because no one else, um, even some of the children and four staff that got tested, no one had a positive result. So that did kind of let us know what we were doing with trying to create the best practices possible with social distancing and the early learning center were working. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, there is a question, <clears throat> there are a couple questions that, uh, that we might have to defer on, but I, I do want to raise these. Uh, so number one, Laura in her introduction mentioned that we have three other uh, webinars that we're doing next week. 
uh, one on Monday, the 22nd, that talks about mental health and self-care for child care providers. And we'll show you a link for that before we close out the webinar tonight. And then on Wednesday, the 24th, we have an afternoon session at 4.30 for center-based programs and an evening session at seven o'clock for family child care. And that's where we're gonna talk about lessons learned from EPIC sites and EPSA sites. And uh, based on the question that Tracy just answered, we will have the Maryland Department of Health uh, as part of the panel for that discussion. So some very specific questions that you may have about uh, quarantine, about uh, testing, uh, the, the Maryland Department of Health will be able to, uh, to answer those much more specifically. Uh, another question that I don't think we can answer tonight is my preschool program is closed from March 13th due to COVID-19. The government will help finance for reopen of our preschool program. That's what we're recommending to the state. Uh, that currently does not exist. And uh, our recommendations as part of this survey, plus there are work groups working with the state, making recommendations as to what should be in place to help existing programs uh, get back on their feet. So we can't answer that right now. Uh, likewise, there's a question that is more of an MSDE question than one we can answer. Do you believe that EPIC program will return this fall in lieu of the possibility of COVID-19 getting worse? I think that is a possibility. Uh, I don't know that there are plans currently from the Maryland State Department of Education, uh, but uh, that, that certainly is one thing. Uh, I think they're waiting to see what the current limitations for child care uh, in, in place, uh, what that does in terms of whether we see any rises in the, the uh, cases or whether it, it's flattened or whether it diminishes. Um, this is a question, uh, this is the uh, follow-up to the question about taking children outside. What preparation will you do for a rainy day? Tracy, do you have anything in terms of taking the children out? You mentioned you have a large muscle room, if I recall correctly. So um, we do, but we shut down um, one of the guidance for Epic is um, no share spaces. So our big growth motor room, we did close it down. Okay. Encourage the teachers to kind of move the kind of plan to do active large growth motor activities and move some of the tables to give them a little bit more room inside the classrooms to just so to eliminate and minimize the risk of exposure. Okay. And it does Great. limit, you know, um, some of the choices they used to have and with having such a big, beautiful building that we have, but. We try to do this to ensure everyone stays safe and healthy. Okay, thank you. Maria, any suggestions for rainy days? Um, I have a covered deck so I can take my kids out. Okay. Um, but I just think just separating them and making them do um, large muscle activities indoors, um, you know, try as much as possible to social distance the children and have these activities for them would help them. Um, it's supposed to rain tomorrow and my mm -hmm. wife and I are taking care of our grandchildren. So if you contact me at the end of the day, I can tell you what I would have to put into place <laughs> for rainy day activities. Um, here, here's a, a sort of a question that follows up on that. And I think it's a really good question. How did you communicate with families about new routines and policies and when did you need to address a COVID exposure? And uh, Tracy, can we begin with you since you mentioned that that, that was uh, something that happened in your program? So right away, Steve, I think um, what parents really feel reassured about is that we have been very transparent and throughout um, throughout the exposure. And I think parents, and especially being a parent myself, is just being, they, they knew right away. So as soon as we found out, they knew we'd be informed the staff and we just immediately went to action um, with, with contact in the Baltimore City Health Department, all of our partners, licensing. 
And I would assume that the, the health department had guidance that you could use with parents and with staff as well? Yes. Okay. So um, when, for instance, once there is an exposure, children that are enrolled cannot center hop, for lack of a better word, to minimize breath. Maria, uh, do you have anything about how you communicated to parents? I know we talked about uh, that parents couldn't come into the house, uh, that there were temperature checks. How did you convey that to um, parents? I think being open with the parents is most important. And I would communicate um, with them either by email or text them mm -hmm. and tell them what we were doing so they knew exactly what they had to do when they came into the pro when they came to the door. Okay. Good, thank you. Tracy, there's a very specific question for you. Uh, for Tracy, did you continue to pay staff and charge tuition while uh, closed for COVID? No, we did not. We continued to pay staff. We did not charge tuition for um, parents who were not. Fine. And again, Tracy, if I may say so, and Tracy, I would certainly ask you to uh, chime in on this. Uh, Tracy, ha Tracy's program has the benefit of early Head Start funding and subsidy funding. Uh, so unlike other programs that didn't have that, uh, there was a bit of, of, uh, of some incoming funding for her to be able to do what she did. Uh, here's a question for each of you. Uh, did you wear a shield, a face shield? Our, um, we, I wear face, um, a facial mask every day. All my staff are required to wear masks. The only time I take my mask off is if I'm in my office by myself, but as soon as someone comes, um, it's back on. So yeah, all staff are in the, just hearing Maria talk, um, we have virtual staff meetings and some of the staff who were not on site was curious about how the children um, were we at and quite, um, I was surprised they really, they would still smile at us almost, like they, it became a part of our face. Mm -hmm. uh, how about with you, Maria? Did you just wear a face mask or did you have a shield? Um, no, just a face mask. Okay. Okay. Um, it's hard. It is very <laughs> difficult. It's very difficult. I agree. Um, I, I don't wear one as much as either of you do, but I find it difficult. So uh, it's, it's very challenging, especially since that's not something we did before this pandemic. Uh, Tracy, I think this is a very specific question for you. How many children do you have in a classroom where you can have them social distancing? We don't have any more than, ten, um, sorry, seven children in a room. Okay. And how many adults are with them in that group? Um, between two or three. Okay. We make Thank sure you. that at that um, require 10 person, which include the teachers and children setting. Okay. Um, how do you work with little children during this crisis? Uh, Maria, since you mentioned you have two infants and a three-year-old, do you want to take that question first? It, initially, it was very hard because the babies never wanted to be separated because I had little separate areas for them with their toys so that they wouldn't touch each other and they would cry to be to get to be close to one another um when i would get ready to get lunch ready for them i would put them in the exosaucer and they figured out that if they moved hard enough that the exosaucer would move mm -hmm. and they would try to get closer with one another and i would separate and they would scream and cry so it was hard i mean it's it gets easier mm -hmm. as as we as the days have gone by it's gotten a lot easier um, and the three-year-old, of course, he enjoyed because he was by himself. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a challenge when um, come Monday and I start two more kids coming in. It's going to be a challenge because at that point, you know, he'll want to go play with them. And I have to say, no, you have to keep. But he's been pretty good. I've been telling him it's the virus. We have to be careful. And he's, he listens, but occasionally he'll just want to run and touch the babies and I have to remind him. Um, so we just have to keep um, reinforcing whatever we are doing and keep reminding the children 
quite often that they have to stay away um, from their friends and not be close to one another. And that'll be quite a challenge for children who haven't been in that routine like that three-year-old in your yes. in your program has. Tracy, any thoughts along that one as well? I would say honestly and truly, um, myself along my admin team, we lead in God, but the true heroes are the teachers. They're the ones who put those capes on and do what they do naturally behind their mask, which is a part of that superhero uniform and with me walking around the center, I can honestly say they do their best. They're still having fun with the children, the children. And one teacher actually shared during a virtual staff meeting last week who had not been on site, like how the children respond. It's something innate that you just cannot create in a teacher who loves what they do. And children, mask or no mask, can feel that. And I honestly and truly always believe that. And early child providers, as I stated, all those superheroes who you're not hearing constantly on the news as those essential personnel, but they truly are. They're putting themselves at risk. And I really applaud my staff for rising to the occasion to support those parents who still needed to work, who did not have the comfort of being in their own homes to work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're closing in on the, uh, the end of our webinar. Uh, uh, there are three more questions, one that's probably too big for the time we have left. Uh, one, is, one of the questions or statements is unemployment PPT for family child care is difficult because of the application and the calculations. Is there any technical help for family child care who are struggling with the applications? Um, and I would say number one, I know that several of the child care resource centers did uh, hands-on, virtual hands-on, uh, assistance for family child care and for centers. So you may want to check with your family child care provider. I, I'm not sorry, not family child care provider, your child care resource center. Uh, number two, I did see something this evening that Tom Copeland is doing a webinar on the uh, extension of the PPP program and how to apply for that. So you may want to take a look at that. Um, and then the other piece is we are looking at doing something before the end of the month, which is when PPP expires, a webinar for people who might be interested. So we'll let you know, uh, since you registered for this, uh, if we're able to do that in time. Uh, uh, more of a statement, uh, Montgomery County recently approved financial assistance to offset reopening expenses and losses. Will more counties do the same to help providers? I know that other counties are looking at that. Uh, I don't know what their status is and we'll try to have that, uh, find that out and have that available for folks. Then there's one more question. And again, because we're near the end, uh, I'll, I'll ask a, a quick response from each of our panelists. Recently, the state relaxed ratios for three and four year olds. For providers, how do you feel about the increased ratio and your ability to provide quality experiences and a clean and safe environment while caring for more children. Uh, Tracy, since you have a center-based program, would you mind uh, giving your opinion on that? Sure. One of the things I can generally say is our program is built on um, small ratios pre-COVID, and we still, even with the relax, and we still wanted to ensure we could safely be in the classrooms with only a certain amount of children. So um, good question. Even with things being relaxed, we still try to, to adhere to only a certain amount of children in um, each classroom. Okay, thank you. So there are several other questions here. And again, what I would suggest is these questions and we will carry them over to that session would be more appropriate for the ones that we're doing on the 24th of June. And again, for center-based programs, that'll be 4.30 in the afternoon. For family child care programs, that'll be uh, at seven o'clock in the evening. So let me advance the slides here uh, because um, we wanna get to the end of this. So. Uh, some of the takeaways, uh, conclusions from our survey include, number one, we really do need to re-envision childcare. 
building better child care for children and families. So this isn't back to normal, what normal was before then, before the uh, epidemic. What we need to get to is a new normal. And we really need to re-envision how can we provide supports, much as Tracy's program has, to all providers, center and family providers, and how can we coordinate services? Uh, number two, increase financial support for childcare programs in startup and in operational phases. One of the implications that we saw in the comments of the survey is that many family childcare providers and some centers didn't feel they had the business practices in place to really weather a storm like this. And uh, what we're seeing is we really do need to pay more attention at the beginning of an operation when they're getting licensed to provide business practices. Number three, uh, as part of that, increase training in business operations, not just for startup, but ongoing. How do you evolve a business? Um, how do you set aside a cushion for a business, if at all possible? How do you learn from other childcare providers who are having successes and perhaps do some peer mentoring with them? Uh, people need increased hands-on technical assistance and coaching for the startup phase, again, the business practices, and then increased technical support during the operational phases. So not just help people at the start and then let them go, uh, certainly have supports uh, throughout the operational process. So uh, we've done the questions and answers. We're running out of time. Uh, we would like your feedback on this webinar. Uh, we pay attention to what you tell us. Uh, we learn from what you tell us. So um, you will have this if you downloaded the slides. Uh, we'll take a moment so that you can write this down. There are just four questions, if I recall correctly. And we would like your feedback on this uh, so that we can do these better in the future or do more of what you'd like uh, in the future. Uh, this is our schedule for the next series. Again, on the 22nd at 7. Who is caring for the caregivers, meeting the needs of child care providers during the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, we also have something on the 24th, again, for family child care providers, uh, sorry, for center-based providers, what EPIC and EPSA providers can teach us about reopening child care, again, for centers on the 24th at 4.30. And then EPIC lessons learned, what EPIC and EPSA providers can teach us about reopening family child care on June the 24th at seven o'clock. And the links to those registrations uh, hopefully are the same ones that you use to get to this particular webinar. Uh, they're off of Maryland Family Network's website and at our calendar of events. Uh, the other thing, we want you to stay in touch with us if you're interested in the study, uh, if you're interested in finding out other services through us or through the Child Care Resource Centers, we hope that you will get in touch with us at mccrninfo at marylandfamilynetwork.org. So before we close out, I would like to thank Tracy Harris for her participation and Maria Peso. Uh, I know that both of your schedules are very busy. And in addition to their joining us tonight, they were very gracious in doing some dress rehearsals with us and having conversations. So. It is greatly appreciated what you did and the information that you shared, and thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, again, this is how you get in touch with us. Uh, thank you all for your participation. Please have a great evening. Good night. Thank you, Steve. Good night.